Mindfulness isn't simply a matter of being aware of things as they happen. It means remembering. Remembering things that are going to be useful to get the mind into concentration. That's right mindfulness. Remembering to recognize what's good when it comes up in the mind, recognizing what's not so good, and remembering what you can do. Things you've learned from books, things you've learned from Dharma talks, things you've learned from your own experience. So when you're being mindful of the breath, it means you keep the breath in mind, and you remember to keep the breath in mind each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out. And if anything comes up in the mind that's going to pull you away, you recognize that oh, this is a hindrance. Thoughts that in the course of the normal day would be perfectly okay are not welcome now, because you're setting the mind on a task, which is to get it to settle down with a sense of well-being. And so when you're with the breath, you want to be careful to notice, remember, what kind of breathing feels good. You've tried breathing in the past, have lots of experience with breathing, but we haven't paid much attention to it for the most part. So try to notice when the breath is comfortable, when it's not. And learn how to recognize the signs of when you've been breathing in. At what point does the breath get too long? Or if you've been engaging in really short breathing and you don't feel right, you know, how do you read that as a sign? You've got to breathe longer. These are things you learn from experience. And you remember that it is okay to play with the breath. I don't know how many people have come here who have been told that you're just supposed to let the breath do its own thing. You don't do anything at all. Just accept the breath as it is. Well, the breath as it is, is, as the Buddha calls it, a bodily fabrication. And the word fabrication there means that there's an intentional element. There's at least part of the mind that's watching over the breath and deciding when to stop breathing in, when to stop breathing out. And you have to look at the settings for that part of the mind. What is it used to decide? If you want to get sensitive to the intentional element in the breathing, then change your intention around the breathing. Tell yourself you're going to breathe longer, shorter, and see how it goes. In other words, that's something else you remember about the breath, is that it's not doing it on its own. We can leave it on automatic pilot, but that means simply that a subconscious mind, <coughs> excuse me, a subconscious part of the mind is making these decisions. And if you're going to meditate and learn about your mind, you can't leave these things in the subconscious area. You've got to bring them up into the light of the day. That's mindfulness. And this alertness, just being very clear about what you're doing, what the breath is doing, what the mind is doing. Noticing when the mind is with the breath, noticing when it's wandered away. And there's something else you want to remember. Try to be ardent. In other words, try to do this well. When the breath does wander away, Excuse me, when the mind does wander away, you don't just leave it wandering. You bring it back. If it wanders again, you bring it back again. It's like training a dog. If you give in to the dog, the dog's never going to get trained. So you've got to show who's in charge here. Your desire to get the mind to settle down, that should be in charge. But as with training the dog, you can't just grab the breath and grab the mind and keep them there. 
You have to find ways of making the mind want to stay. This is why as you're with the breath, you try to be as sensitive as possible to how it feels. And as sensitive to the least little bit of tension, tightness, blockage you may feel in the breath. Remembering that the breath gets not just the air coming in and out through the nose, but also the movement of energy through the whole body. So you want to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out. This element of ardency includes desire. We read so much about dispassion, dispassion, dispassion in the Buddhist teachings. And it's true, we have to learn dispassion for the things that cause suffering and dispassion for the clinging that is suffering itself. We've got to have some passion for the path. I've got to have some desire. All things, the Buddha said, are rooted in desire. And that includes the path. When we get to the end, you put it down. Or as in Ananda's analogy, you have a desire to go to a park, but once you've arrived at the park, you don't need that desire anymore. You can put it aside. But as long as you haven't gotten there, the desire is what's going to get you there. So this is a desire you have to cultivate. It's part of our motivation. It's basically that we're discontent. You hear a lot about contentment in the Buddhist teachings too, but the Buddha says you've got to have some discontent with your level of skill if you're going to get anywhere in the path. So what it means is we take these qualities of desire and discontent, a sense of lack, and we focus them in the right direction. Here it's getting the mind to settle down. When you're out in the world, it's getting yourself to stick with the precepts, trying to be as skillful as possible in how you deal with other people, and not get taken in by their values. Because they've got their desires, too. And then you have to ask yourself, why should I give in to their desires if they're going to be harmful for them and for me? You've got to hold to your original desire, which is a harmless desire, the desire to put it into suffering. It's not selfish. It's not harmful. And the more you can keep this desire number one in your mind, the better off you'll be, the better off everybody else. So we're not here just practicing dispassion and contentment, letting go. There are things we have to develop, good qualities we have to develop, and it requires desire. And we have to have a sense of direction as to what we're doing. We are on a path. We're not just wandering through the forest wherever. We've got to have a sense of direction. The direction is that we want to find a happiness that's reliable, a happiness that's harmless. And that's going to require giving up a lot of things and going against the flow in a lot of ways. Because the flow is basically to keep coming back, coming back, coming back to more suffering. That's the natural flow. You were going against the stream. Trying to find a way to stop creating more suffering for ourselves. The Buddha calls this process samsara. Notice that it's a process. Sometimes you hear the idea that samsara is the world we live in. And you hear about people trying to get out of samsara. It sounds like they're trying to run away. And sometimes they're accused of being uncompassionate, not caring about other people, leaving them in samsara while you get out. But samsara is not a place, it's a process. It's something we're all doing, and we're not, and the problem is we're doing it poorly. That's why we keep coming back. So it's not an issue of trying to get out, it's more an issue of trying to become more skillful to stop this process by which we keep creating more and more suffering for ourselves. There's nothing selfish about that. 
the more you get your mind trained, the less suffering you're causing other people, or the less pain you're causing them. And as for the suffering they're creating for themselves, if they see your example. They say, oh, this is how you stop. You've done them a favor. There was a book I read years back where they said the Buddha had the chance to decide between greatness and goodness, and he chose goodness. And the author was thinking of greatness in terms of being great like a king. But I remember as I was reading it, it struck me he had it backwards, the author. If the Buddha had been good, he would have done what his parents told him, he would have done what his family told him, done what society had told him. But he wanted something great, something that goes beyond the normal run of things. So this is a large desire that the Buddha had, and it's a large desire that he's encouraging us to have as well. We get our minds under control so we can understand them, and understand this process by which we keep creating more and more suffering. That's a big desire. So own up to it. Give it priority. And then as with any path of practice that depends on desire, you have to realize that if you sit there thinking about the goal, how much you want the, the mind to settle down, how much you'd like to have nirvana come pretty soon, that's not going to make it happen. In fact, that kind of desire gets in the way. You want to take that desire and focus on what you're doing right now. It's a big desire, and all of a sudden it has to get very small, focused on this breath, this breath, what you're doing with this breath. But as John Lee said, this is how the Buddha became great. He started, started out small, did each step well, because each step was well-founded, well-grounded. It became a good foundation for things that were bigger. So this is the quality of ardency. It's that desire to put an end to suffering focused on this breath, this moment of the mind. Being wholehearted and doing it well. When you have these three qualities, mindfulness, alertness, and ardency. That's how you get the mind into concentration and how you use the concentration. to understand what's going on inside. But the results don't stay just inside, they spread out in, in all directions. And they take the mind to a place that's beyond all directions. So even though the range of our awareness is small, just the extent of our body right here not going out past the skin. Still, the implications can be huge. <laughs>